Hello and welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Samulski, joined as always by Scott Pianowski as we finish our preseason position previews for the hitters. Um, we are going into part two of our outfield preview, which we will go through the top 20 outfielders for both Scott and my rankings. Um, if you haven't yet heard part one, I would go back and listen to that first. We recorded that earlier this week, where Scott and I went through outfielders 21 through 40 on each of our rankings, touched on some deep league sleepers, um, sorry, deep league options, some sleepers that weren't in our top 40. So that's where you'll get a lot of the info on the, the back half of the rankings. Today is pretty much going to be focused solely on these top 20 guys. Uh, we're going to try to talk about these guys in a little bit more depth, what separates each of them. Um, and then also, if you haven't heard any of the other positional previews, obviously this is our last hitter preview, which means we've covered every single other position. Um, so make sure you check that out on Apple or Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Scott, we're, we're bringing it home with the hitters today. Yeah, outfield is obviously a gigantically important fantasy position. And I don't think we're top, talking top 20 today. So these are guys you're going to spend early picks on and your first round may have anywhere from five to seven or eight outfielders. We just did a mock on Yahoo with some of our guys and it was a very heavy first round. So fun guys to draft. I don't think the position overall is as deep as it's maybe been in past seasons. So I'm going to be a little bit, a lot of times in, in past seasons, I would be proactive towards, okay, I have a tie. I'll go towards the infielder. I don't think that applies necessarily to the 2024 draft pool. Yeah, and Scott and I talked about this on the last episode, just uh, strategies, different strategies in the three-catcher. Uh, sorry, three-catcher. That would be a disaster league. You'd yeah, let's get a three-catcher league start. By the way, you know, yeah. remember Yahoo, customize, customizability is, is your friend. If you want to do the three-catcher league and, and invite Eric because he's dying to do that format, just know <laughs> that you can do it on Yahoo. Um, yeah, please, so please don't reach consider. out to me when you do that. Um, but, yeah, we uh, the three outfield leagues, five outfield leagues, we talked about the difference between a 12-team league, a 15-team league. So we talked about those different strategies um, in part one of our outfield breakdown right at the top of the episode. Um, so if you don't even really care about hearing our thoughts on those uh, players but want to hear our thoughts on different strategies and different types of leagues, listen to the beginning of, of that episode. Um, we did cover last week some guys that moved teams – um, and, you know, we're interesting from some of the deeper league aspects. Uh, we're going to cover some guys who um, have a little bit of a different look this year that are just within our top 20. Um, so the big news most recently in terms of the outfield position was Cody Bellinger uh, coming back to the Chicago Cubs. Um, it felt like this had been a given over the last few weeks. I know earlier on in the offseason, I kind of thought, you know, Bellinger might make sense um, with the Yankees, obviously that all traded with the uh, chain, sorry, with the Soto trade. And then the the positions, the, the teams that needed uh, Bellinger's positions seemed to kind of dwindle. So were you kind of expecting this? Like, does this change anything for you? Or is this kind of status quo based on what you were expecting going into the year? This is exciting news to me because one of the themes that's emerged in fantasy baseball over the last maybe 10 years this may have been true all along, but it's something that I've stared into a lot recently. And uh, Colton and the Wolfman, great fantasy draft team, talk about this a lot. It's when a player changes teams on a big contract. Trey mm -hmm. Turner did it last year, three months of hell. The previous year, Marcus Simeon changed teams and went through all sorts of stress. I was nervous if Bellinger signed with the Yankees, signed with the Mets, signed somewhere where he'd be the signature target player. And maybe and remember his career's been all over the map. He was an MVP in 2019. He forgot how to hit for a few seasons. We didn't know, you know, he seemed like the the back foot slider had just eaten him up. His confidence was gone. Last year he has a monster season: 307, 356, 525 slash power, speed. The Cubs are a good lineup. I, I'm just so glad he's back where mm -hmm. he, he already knows where you know he lives, where the restaurants are, what the ballpark's like. You know, he's he's in a groove, he's into an age 28 season. I didn't want him to change teams and become a high stress, high anxiety player where maybe I had to not draft him proactively. I, in fact, in the TGFBI that's going on right now, uh, I think he was my fourth or fifth round pick qualifies at first base. In addition to outfield and Yahoo leagues, I want you to go draft Cody Bellinger. This is the best possible landing spot for him. Yeah. We'll talk about it more. Um, I just published an article today on NBC sports. That was about hitters with poor barrel rates who had um, relatively good home run numbers. Um, and Bellinger featured on that, and there are a couple interesting things that I'll, I'll share as we get to him in our rankings. Uh, the big news in outfield land in the offseason is obviously Juan Soto being traded to the Yankees. Um, 
for those deep league players out there, I also think it's interesting that Trent Grisham went over in this deal. Um, that ballpark may not be great for Alex Verdugo's skill set, but that ballpark is great for Trent Grisham's skill set. Trent Grisham um, barrels the hell out of the ball, hits it really hard, plays elite defense and can run. I don't think they're going to play Trent Grisham over Alex Verdugo, but I do think Trent Grisham is a really great fourth outfielder uh, for Yankee Stadium. He's always run low batting averages, and the Yankees have in the past been okay with that with guys who who hit for good power. I don't think that Grisham is going to magically not be like a 220 or 230 hitter. But if he works his way into that lineup, um, I think you could get some real power speed output from, from Grisham. So just, you know, save that for later. Um, but Juan Soto to the Yankees, did it change your view of him as a, as a fantasy player at all, given that ballpark or that and that lineup too? Oh, for sure. Um, Yankee Stadium, we talked about in some of the earlier episodes. It's actually misunderstood sometimes because a great home run park, but actually a slight negative for scoring. But Man, scoring is going to go up when you have somebody who's led Major League mm -hmm. Baseball and walks uh, three of the last five years. His career on base percentage is 421. We know he's a batting title in his back pocket. He's somebody who slugged as high as 695 in a season. I, I feel like there's still a, an MVP year percolating in Juan Soto. And now he'll obviously be batting in front of Judge, which is the place you want to be in the Yankee lineup. Maybe not the classic Yankee lineup. We think of one to nine. That's a monster. It's This is not the Dodgers yeah. lineup. This is not the Braves lineup. But... I don't know, top five, top six lineup. Yeah, I'm excited about one. So I, I, I'm not thrilled about it as a Red Sox fan, although they're so down bad right now. I'm not even sure they're competing with the Yankees. They're just trying to be over 500 and sell something to their fans. But uh, Juan Soto looks like a monster and certainly parked in the first round if you want Juan Soto. Yeah, I think to me, this doesn't change his profile at all. Um, you know, 35 home runs. I mean, it, it might change. In terms of the run totals, he's going to hit a little higher up in the lineup with guys like Judge behind him. Um, you know, that could push him over 100 runs this year. But I think he hit 275 last year with 35 home runs. Um, I, I think that's kind of where you're at. I don't know, know that you're going to get a massive power boost. You know, we talked about this where, like, Juan Soto is Juan Soto. He's not changing his approach because he's going to Yankee Stadium. He's not going to try to yank and lift balls out of the short porch. He knows what works for him. He believes that he's a very talented hitter when he's patient and looks for his pitches. He's going to keep doing that. He can drive the ball out of the ballpark, out of any ballpark with his natural power. So it doesn't matter for him. If he sees a pitch he can drive to left center, he's going to drive it to left center. I don't think he's waiting on stuff that he can yank out of the yard to right so that he could push 45 home runs. So I think if you're doing your own projections, I wouldn't bank on a major improvement from 35 home runs last year for, for San Diego. I think he, he'll finish somewhere between 35 and 40 home runs. He'll hit 275 or, or maybe down to 270. We talked about Yankee Stadium docks batting average a little bit because of how um, uh, small the outfield is. So it's easier for outfielders to get to balls in caps. Um, so maybe you're looking at like 270 with 35 to 40 home runs and over 100 runs in RBIs. Um, you know, if he hits in front of Judge, maybe he doesn't steal more than 12 bases because why are you running when you're in front of Aaron Judge? But he should still push double digits. So, yeah, I, I'm totally fine with Juan Soto where he's going. Um, the only knock on him is if you are trying to get more stolen bases early on, um, you may look for, for somebody else. But, again, I, there's nothing wrong with this, with this profile at all. I, I want to say that I, I think last year 275 was about the lowest he could have hit career 284 hitter most of the projection system have him in the 280 to 285 range and also for him to play a full season and have a 410 obp and not score 100 runs that, that's not going to yeah. happen on this team right. I, I, yes. and i think to the point that i think he could lead the american league in runs uh, I, I maybe i wouldn't put him on a level with uh, the projection i'll give acuna or mookie Betts for runs scored but Juan Soto should score like 110, 115 runs. So last year, 97, I felt like that was the worst he could have done. And maybe people have to, Yankee fans have to be realistic about this. Juan Soto spits on borderline pitches. Right. So there's going to be times where there's like a 3 1 pitch, it's borderline. Juan Soto's like, I'm not swinging at that. I'm going to walk to first base. That's who he is. You know, he's yeah. not trying to hit 45 home runs. He's, he's not, you know, sometimes that type of player can be, you know, Joey Votto went through it his whole career. Joey Votto, probably a hall of famer and Reds mm -hmm. fans will be like, why is he walking so much? We want him driving runs in. I hope the Yankee fans are realistic about that. 
Yeah, um, I fully agree with that. Well, you mentioned Mookie Betts. I, I want to talk about him very, very briefly. We talked about him on the second base episode. Um, he obviously will, will come up in our rankings here because he is outfield eligible as well. Um, do you have a preference where you play him? Are you drafting him to play him at second? Are you okay drafting him as an outfielder? Does it matter to you? I'm drafting him as a wait and see. And if the draft that I'm in affords me good middle infield value, maybe I'll sign him in the outfield. If you know, I, I may play him in the middle infield, if this, just the way the draft falls. I feel like most drafts start out where you're just trying to get the best numbers and the best mm-hmm. career arcs and the best lineups and all that stuff. And then you get three, four, five, six rounds in. It's okay. What's the shape of my team? What categories do I need? What positions have I filled? Yeah. And I just love getting a guy. I talked about Bellinger earlier, qualifies at first base and outfield, and first base isn't as deep as it's been in previous years. The fact that Mookie Betts can play any of three positions, and I just draft him as an offensive god on, along with the Braves, the signature team in fantasy, I think 10 uh, of the top 110 players in Yahoo ADP right now are Dodgers. So it just shows you, you know, and a lot of it's the pitching staff too, I get it. But obviously a lineup we're going to draft aggressively into. I'll figure out Mookie bets his position later. Um, yes. But I, I I love having some flexibility in my roster. I love having some of those Legos. That's normally a thing that I th- think about. No, normally the guys who are drafted in the first round don't play multiple positions. I think it's rare to have somebody who actually gobbles up three positions. And and even with sometimes with players who bounce around, I don't like it because I wonder if it's going to be stressful on them. They, have, they don't know what position they're playing every day and all that stuff. I don't think any of that bothers Mookie Betts. He's one of the safest picks. Obviously, his upside is he could be an MVP. He could score 135 runs. But you're also buying Mookie Betts because he has that terrific floor. I'll figure out his position later. Yeah, I just uh, was in the turf league, which is you know one of the earth leagues, which is um, in- industry leagues, uh, last week. And I took M- uh, Mookie Betts with the intention of making him my second baseman. And then middle infield values just kept dropping and dropping and dropping in the draft when I was like, I'm not going to take – a player that I think is worse, who's an outfielder over this second baseman who dropped. Um, And so I wound up with Mookie Betts in the outfield, which wasn't my intention when I started the draft, but that he taking him there gives you that flexibility to kind of to zig or zag, depending on what was happening in your room. And as you mentioned, that's an incredibly valuable thing that not a lot of positions give you Um, Bellinger, is one of those guys. Um, we're not going to see a lot of those guys uh, on our list today. But before we get to our lists today, spring training is here. So for those looking to get ahead on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. That's NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code baseball24 to get 10% off at checkout. Um, so, Scott, as we go through our rankings, uh, we're going to stop at 13 here because, you know, we'll just give people our top 12 in case you're, you know, you are in um, a 12 team league. Who are the outfielders you would want kind of as your outfield one is how we're, we're looking at that. Um, so, working backwards from 20 to 13, uh, who are your outfielders? I think Josh Lowe parked at number 20. Tampa Bay does like to put out a different lineup every day, but he'll be somebody who plays every day and coming off a breakout season. Spencer Steer at 19. I think it's very important to get the Cincinnati Reds right this year. They have too many good players for not enough positions, but Steer bounces around the, the field. Should be in the lineup every day. A little bit dinged up right now, but I'm excited to to draft Spencer Steer. Mike Trout, somebody I'm not excited to draft. There isn't that much left in Anaheim, he has talked about maybe the Angels adding players. We'll see if that happens. It may be a pitcher, but obviously Atani's gone. Trout's not running anymore. I'm not. He's not a proactive pick for me at all. I know not everybody agrees. Obviously, one of the best players of our generation, so it's not fun to watch this. Jazz Chisholm at 17 just needs to stay healthy. An interesting power speed guy. Nolan Jones, Anaheim's lineup is sad. How about this Colorado lineup? There isn't much there. Chris Bryant contract looks like an albatross already. But Nolan Jones came on the scene last year and looks like the best thing in a Colorado lineup that generally me- leaves me a little bit depressed. Christian Yelich, I can't talk about him without thinking about Bellinger, the two former MVPs. I wasn't sure what they were last year. Bellinger had the loud comeback. Maybe Yelich had the more quiet comeback, but he's going to run. He'll hit for some power, should hit for a plus average. He'll get a lot of volume at the top of the Milwaukee lineup. I think it's the boring veteran value days for Christian Yelich, and I've been drafting him a fair amount 
in the early season. Randy Rosarena, talk about boring veterans. It seems like he has the same season every year. Not the highest percentage stealer of bases, but he's still running, which is generally all we care about. And I think he makes sense as the number 14 outfielder. We talked a lot about Cody Bellinger already. I have him at 13 right now. He may percolate a little bit higher. I want to be overweight on Cody Bellinger in 2024. Um, we got a lot of the same names here in the back half, just ordered differently. Um, I have Jazz Chisholm as my 20th ranked outfielder. Uh, I have Brian Reynolds at 19. Uh, I believe he was just outside of your top 20. We talked about him on episode one. Um, I also have Mike Trout at 18. I have Christian Yelich at 17. I have Kyle Schwarber at 16. He was another guy who was just outside of your top 20, who um, we talked about a little bit, but we're going to get into more depth today. Um, I have Cody Bellinger at 15. I have Nolan Jones at 14. And I have Adelise Garcia at 13. Um, so I want to start with the the Mike Trout discussion. Um we both have Trout and, and Chisholm in this grouping. To me, it's it's kind of health for both of them, no? I mean, yes, Mike Trout is older, um, and so the health factor may be a little bit more concerning um, with him because we know he's dealing with you know back injuries and things like that that are a little more severe. Uh, Jazz is only 26 years old, but uh, last year he played 97 games. In 2022, he played 60 games. Um, he has a style of play that lends itself to injuries because he goes all out. Um, and that can lead to, you know, lots of kind of d dings. Um, he was able to play 124 games in 2021. Um, and he has grown into a more complete player now. So if we got 124 games, we'd be ecstatic, but, uh, I, I have a real hard time ranking him higher than, you know, some of these guys like. Brian Reynolds and, and Christian Yelich and, you know, guys who I feel more confident in getting longer, you know, stretches of time, even though Jazz has way more upside. That kind of feels like where you're at, too. You're, you're unwilling, given the upside, even with the upside, sorry, to put him much higher than where he's at. Right. Yeah, it, it certainly is a games played projection problem for Chisholm and for Trout, even though they're at different stages of their careers. These should be the fun years for Chisholm. He steps into an age 26 season, and on a rate perspective, he hits 19 home runs in 97 games. He steals 22 bases, only caught three times. I'd love to project that towards even like 140 games. I'd be ecstatic. Um, batting average is probably going to be a little bit of a give back. I, he's a wait and see for me. I, I, a couple of my leagues, I have co-managers, and I'm going to have to take their temperature on Jazz Chisholm. I'm not against necessarily drafting him. Trout somebody I don't want to pick, and I hate saying that, but – Look at the games played. 82 last year, 119 the year before, 36 the year before that. We'll skip the pandemic, 134, 140, 114. You're not getting a full season. Yeah. Ironically, he was actually healthy in 2020. He only missed seven games that year. But yeah. the other six seasons, you're missing anywhere from four to eight weeks with Mike Trout. He doesn't run anymore. He could, just yeah. doesn't want to. The wear and tear, he's into an age 32 season. You don't like the offensive pieces around him. And even the last two years, he's hit 263 and 283. He's, these days are hitting 300 plus probably over. It's going to be an emotional drain, just what's around him. This guy's played three playoff games for his career, which just seems criminally unfair. Mm -hmm. um, we always talk about career advancement and development isn't always linear, but career decline generally is. And yeah, not that Mike Trout is anything to embarrass. You know, he's embarrassed about anything or whatever, but you know, last year, 131 OPS plus. Usually he's in the 170, 180 range. He led Bay, um, the American League in OPS Plus for five straight seasons. He's just not the same guy. And I know you're going to see him in rounds you've never seen him before. Like, oh, my God, how do I not draft Mike Trout? Well, it's no fun to play fantasy baseball like an actuary, but I'm not drafting Mike Trout. I know where this story is headed. I, I, yeah. You have to accept that he's going to miss time, not going to run anymore. There's no buoyancy in this lineup. I think Mike Trout is actually a bad fancy value in 2024. I, I'm going to get creamed on this if he's healthy all season. And people will be like, oh, who's the guy who didn't want Mike Trout? Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, but there it is. I'm not drafting him, man. Yeah, I, I will draft him um, if he falls. And right now he has not been falling to where I'm comfortable drafting him. I have him, I have him projected for 120 games, um, which is pretty much in line with 2022. 
And I'm operating under the assumption that now that Shohei Otani isn't there, there may be some more DH starts uh, to come Mike Trout's way, which could help with some of the, the injury risk because if he's able to rotate in at DH, just you know takes a little bit of strain off of him. Um, but that projection is also with a different lineup around him, right? There's not as many runs or RBIs with a lineup that doesn't include Shohei Otani in it. Um, I still think that Trout can have you know elite power. Right. The average, as you pointed out, is maybe closer to 270, um, 270, 280 maybe is, is who he is now. But even last year without a great year, I mean, you're talking about a 16 percent barrel rate. You're talking about 114 uh, max exit velocities, basically the same average exit velocity he's had in every year, in every full season. He did have like a 94 average exit velocity in 2020. But as you pointed out, it was just 50 games. So it, it's hard to kind of extrapolate that out. So in terms of batted ball quality, he's very much the same or, or similar hitter to who he's always been. But I think, as you pointed out, he's not going to run. The lineup around him is worse. And you have to just not expect close to a full season. And if you do that, right, and I put it into like my SGP, you know, my projection sheet at 120 games, and it gives me what it believes is a fair value um, and I will take him around that spot, which is where you see him in my rankings right now. Um, he's not going there in drafts. And so he's going earlier. And I, I won't, I'm not going to take that risk. Um, but I'm I'm willing to, you know, if he's somebody who I could slot as my, my second or third outfielder, depending on your league type, um, and I really just need the power, I, I'm okay with it. Um, I don't love it, obviously, as much as if I loved taking Mike Trout um, in the past. I also think that he's a toss up with somebody like Brian Reynolds, who you had in last week's episode. Um, but I, I think Brian Reynolds gets criminally underrated because he's, you know, a little boring, but I think the pirates lineup is fine, but not great. But I think that Brian Reynolds is a very clear, like 25 ish home run hitter, right? He's had 24, 27, 24, the last three years, uh, 302, 262, 263 batting averages. So is he a 265, 270 hitter with 25 home runs, double digit steals, you know, 170 runs plus RBIs? Like there's really nothing wrong with that. That that's kind of what you're going to consistently get. No, he's not a 300 hitter, but he's giving you more power. And I think there's, you know, with him getting double digit steals, which I think he will do again. He stole 12 last year. I think Brian Reynolds is like a low-end five-category player. He does help you a little bit everywhere. Um, and so I, I find that to be an incredibly valuable profile that we overlook because there's no narrative you could tell yourself where like, oh, he may hit 30. Oh, he may steal 20. Oh, he may hit 300. He just kind of is what he is, and, and people will take upside gambles over that. But sometimes I just like that steady production. I love boring value players. I just want to give you one more great stat to put a period in Mike Trout. The three batters batting first, second, and fourth around him in the lineup all have ADPs outside the top 500. Talk about having no buoyancy in the lineup. People don't want to draft the three guys around him at the top of his order. Stay away from the Angels. It's just going to crush your soul. Brian Reynolds is, is an eat-your-vegetables pick. He is a boring player. The Pirates are not a glamour team, although O'Neill Cruz – has some buzz about him. He's probably going to about lead off for this team. Brian Hayes, who's, we had had a long talk about him on the third base podcast. You dug up some great stats on Hayes. Go back and listen to that show. You know, the stolen bases are interesting to me. We saw Hayes ran last year. Reynolds got into double digit steals. This is a team that leaned into the new order of baseball and took advantage of that. So I think Reynolds maybe has that 10 to 15 projectability for stolen bases and good at a lot of different things. Bill James talked about this. Why are players underrated or overrated sometimes? A lot of times the specialists are overrated. A lot of times players with broad skills are underrated. Pittsburgh, you know, they're hoping to be competitive. Last year they were in, in competition for about half the year. They fell off in the second half. So I think that leads to you get Brian Reynolds maybe around consistently later than you should. Again, eat your vegetables. It's no fun to eat broccoli, but you know I've actually developed a taste for broccoli in the last few years. And at the draft table, I'll definitely have a taste for the current value of Brian Reynolds. I think he's a great target. Ro roast up some broccoli. It's, it's great. Roast up some um, broccoli and roast up a little Brian Reynolds uh, in <laughs> round seven, round eight, round nine. Again, yes, nobody your draft, unless you're a, in, in a Pittsburgh league, nobody at your draft is wearing a Brian Reynolds jersey. I get it. Right. 
And with the new jerseys, Eric, I don't think anybody's wearing a Red no. Hot's jersey. I, they got to fix that. That is a problem that needs to be fixed. Go back to the, the to the pants. Pop Stargill's you uniforms. Can't, you can't wear the pants out at No, for the sure. Dress. Very front. Yeah, go wear an NBA shirt or a, a, yeah. you know, wear a wear a um I don't know wear a uh, Pittsburgh Steelers jersey if you want. Uh, although just to make sure it's not one of the quarterbacks, right? But uh, Brian Reynolds is one of my favorite targets this year because he's a boring pick, and I like that. It's a lot of what leads to fantasy greatness is in the details mm-hmm. and is in the unglamorous things. A lot of being a great poker player is folding, is doing the boring stuff. It's not about, yeah. oh, I'm going to re-raise and go all in and everything. A lot of it is the nuance. That, you yeah, know, we, it's when you talk yourself back off something and go to something safer can sometimes be the, the right choice. For sure. Um, I, I find myself fading Kyle Schwarber in a lot of drafts um, based on his price. I have him ranked here. You have him ranked just outside of the top 20. So we are both kind of below where he's going based on ADP. Um, I understand that he hits in a good lineup. I understand that he has hit 46 and 47 home runs over the last two years. Um, I don't think that batting average is coming back up. I don't know that he's he's not going to hit 197 again, but some of the projections have him at like 227, 226. Like I don't, I don't see it. Um, It's two years it's 218 in 2022, 197 last year. I do think the banning of the shift, um, you know, it it did. It seems like it hurt him more than it did. I think he got unlucky a little bit last year. The 209 Babib, um, you know, he had a much higher, you know, X average, if that matters to you, as XBA. But I still think this is a guy who's a 220 hitter in a league that now has a much higher average batting average than it did last year. So you really need to be, if you're looking at our 80th percentile marks that we try to hit, right, to make sure we have a well-balanced team, you really need to be around 260 as a team batting average. So if you need to be at 260 and you're going to roster somebody who's going to get, he had 720 plate appearances last year. So if you're going to roster somebody who might push 700 plate appearances of a 210 batting average, you have to do so much work to get the rest of your team up to 260. So I, I, I'm just not drafting Schwarber. And for me, I think like, sure. If the first, if my first few rounds go in a way that I just happen to get multiple, like 300 hitters in the you know early rounds, maybe I'll entertain taking Schwarber, but this is the type of player that like, when we talked about Estuary Ruiz with speed, I think with Kyle Schwarber, like you need to plan around saying, okay, I'm going to draft Kyle Schwarber. That's what I want to do. So I need to make sure I get player A and player B early on in the draft. And then I need to make sure I get players C and D later in the draft to prop up my batting average. Because this is not a bad batting average from somebody like Brent Rooker, who's going to play, you know, get 450 plate appearances. This is a bad batting average from somebody who is going to be up 700 times which means that bad batting average is going to, that drain is extrapolated because he gets so many more plate appearances. Um, so I don't know where you're at with Schwarber, but for me, it's just not a, a puzzle piece that fits well with how I want to build my team. Yeah, I'd prefer not to draft him, even though he's a monster in three categories. It's interesting that he did steal two base, uh, 10 bases two years ago, but last year he totally shut that yeah. down, didn't steal any. But as you talked about, so we're just going to be signing off on agreement here. You draft Schwarber, that affects so many other picks that you have to make to rebuild your batting average, or God forbid you have to punt it, which I, I hate punting any category. And then maybe right. other categories you fall out of. You, maybe your bullpen falls apart. You drafted saves and you don't have them all of a sudden on June 1st. What do you do then? I feel like a Schwarber pick is tied to making other selections. And then what if your league requires two catchers and the catcher you want is like one of those 25 home run catchers who might hit 220. Right. You like, are, a, like a like a Shea Langoliers type who I, I feel I feel I really like there's like, like 10 that. guys like yeah. that, right? Yeah. And again, we've gone through all the positions. So if you need some catcher help, we talked extensively about that position. But I just feel that I want fluidity in my draft, Eric. I want the ability, and that's you know, we talked about multiple position guys. Mm-hmm. What does that gain you? The advantage to go where the stats are and you can make the positions fit. Kyle Schwarber is going to put a drain on your flexibility. It is, yeah. It's going to be you're, you're like it's almost like playing a man down. You're going to have to do things you have to do versus things you would like to do. And right. I, don't, I don't want it to have to be drafting that way in a constricted manner in the middle of the draft. That's what you get when you draft Kyle Schwarber. Yeah, I don't like being forced into corners that I have to draft him. Um, 
Nolan Jones is somebody I want to talk about very briefly. I think some people look at where he's going in drafts right now and they think that he's potentially too high. Is it a fluke? Can I can I count on that again? I think it's important to understand, first of all, he had the quietest 2020 season that I think we've ever seen with a, with a really good batting average. Um, he was a really well-regarded prospect in Cleveland. I know that his, you know, he didn't really get a chance and then got shipped off to Colorado and everybody's kind of thinking that there's something wrong with him. But he was a very well-regarded prospect. Um, and I think that he left a little meat on the bone last year when you look at his batted ball quality. Um, he hits the ball in the air hard and on pulled fly balls, he hits the ball in the air 99.5 miles an hour. That is the same exit velocity on pulled fly balls as Pete Alonso, Rafael Devers, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. So in terms of batted ball contact, Nolan Jones hits the ball as hard as a lot of guys we think of as great power hitters. Jones only pulled the ball in the air 5.4% of the time last year. The league average of pulled fly balls um, was uh, 8%. Okay. So, sorry, 7%. So he pulled the ball in the air below league average, despite being well above average in terms of his pulled fly ball, batted ball contact. We understand he plays in Coors Field. So we know what can happen if he starts pulling the ball in the air more because of that park. So I, I don't think this is a case where we're going to see real regression. Even if he doesn't sell out for more power, he's he has the power to hit 20 home runs, even with an all fields approach. So I think that 2020 season is, is a pretty good indicator of what you can expect from him. Um, and I think, you know, Coors Field also really does prop up batting average as well. I think we look at it just as like a power park, but that's not really the case. It boosts batting average as well, and I know he will go on the road. But I, I don't see anything fluky in what he did last year. Um, and based on your ranking, you know, you have him two spots lower than me. I guess you don't really see anything fluky either. For sure. I, I'm in on Nolan Jones and, and man, Cleveland, would they love to have him back? They traded him for Juan Brito, who right now looks like a fizzled prospect. So um, talk about a team that could use an influx of offensive talent. And, and last year, actually, Jones had a higher OPS on the road, which is almost impossible for a Colorado hitter, but that speaks to his ability to be a productive player no matter where he is. The lineup isn't isn't great. It's one of the worst Colorado lineups I've ever seen. You have to live with that. But you make that great point that we're talking about a guy, second round pick, who before he made the majors, he was on all the prospect boards as like a top 40 to top 60 prospect. So I don't know why Cleveland gave up on him so quickly and traded him for just another minor league prospect. I, I, I kept thinking uh, as you were talking, I'm like, did they get somebody else in that trade? There must have been something I'm forgetting. No, it was it was Juan Brito. That was it. I don't know why Cleveland just soured on Nolan Jones, but they did. They decided he couldn't play. Great pickup for the Rockies. One of the few things you can feel good about in this lineup. Eric, this, I've never been in a season where I wanted – less of the Colorado lineup than I do, but Nolan yeah. Jones is the, is the exception to the rule. He's a proactive pick for me. Yeah, I, f I fully agree with you. Um, I want to talk – What last thing I want to – I guess I'll just promote my own work for a second, but I just Why published not? an article today um, on hitters with poor barrel rates who had good home runs and just kind of – I called it the Isak Paredes leaderboard um, to see which guys are maybe being undervalued uh, in terms of their power production. Cody Bellinger popped on there. Um, so I did want to talk about him because he's in this section of both of our rankings. Uh, he hit, um, 26 home runs last year, only 17 of those, right. Came on pulled fly balls or line drives, which means Bellinger was using the whole field and has enough power to hit home runs, um, in the whole field. There was this great Twitter thread by Sarah Sanchez, who, um, covers the Cubs as a diehard fan. And I, I, uh, linked to that in the article, but she went through fan graphs um, sorted by count and sorted by runners on base or runners not on base and basically did a lot to prove that Bellinger had a very clear approach change with runners on base and when he got behind in the count, which led to this kind of like quote unquote poor batted ball contact. So the vast majority of Bellinger's home runs came when he's early in the count, early in the count or when he was ahead in the count. Mm -hmm. And very few came when he was behind in the count. What's interesting also is that um, most of his home runs came with the bases empty. He hit 17 home runs 
with nobody on base. And he hit nine home runs with runners on base. Most of the time with runner on with runners on base, his batting average goes up and his slugging percentage goes down. Um, and then Kyle Bland from Pitcherless also weighed in on this with um, more kind of like data oriented stuff that that you know I don't know how he gets all this information, but it's great. But he basically found that Cody Bellinger had above average league power with less than two strikes and below average power marks with two strikes. And he made elite contact with two strikes and just, you know, quote unquote, good contact with less than two strikes. And so that very clearly points out that like that Bellinger is swinging for more power early in counts when he gets behind or when runners get on base, he's very clearly just shortening up, trying to make contact, get a single drive in a run, right? I don't need to, to hit the ball in the gap. I don't need to put the ball out of the park. So I think this is really important when you look at the batting average because he hit 300 last year, but a lot of projection systems have him down at like 260. Um, and I think to me, that's not acknowledging this clear shift in a contract, a contact centric approach. This is a guy who very clearly when he gets behind in the count or when he gets runners on base is saying, I just want to get a hit. I'm just going to shorten up and put it in play. And especially now that there's no shift, the, a lot of those balls are going through for hits. So I don't see any reason that Bellinger drops 40 points in batting average with this approach. And I also think it's reasonable that he still hits around 25 home runs because even though his barrel rates don't look great, when he is ahead in the count, he has the same kind of power that would make him hit for that kind of home run totals. So he still is going to do that. It's just not going to be all the time. So the barrel rates are going to look different. So I, I really don't – I think we're overweighing his contact quality last year and saying, oh, he got lucky. It, it's not lucky. It's just a part of an approach. And sure, maybe he doesn't hit 300, but I think he's probably hitting 280 again if he, if he does this. So I'm with you. I, I'm fully in on Bellinger, and I think projection systems are, you know, because they're algorithms, right, they're not really weighing in what he changed last year in order to make these results happen. Love it. And, and this has really become the Cody Bellinger episode, but I'm all here for it. Remember also he can play at first base in Yahoo, like Nolan Jones, who's first base and outfield eligible in Yahoo. Bellinger, Bill James always talked about the best players usually being the smartest players. And you talked about how Bellinger changed his approach and what a thinking man. And, and granted, when he was going bad, maybe he was thinking too much. Maybe he needed to be more reactive, but he seemed like he fixed a lot of things last year, including this shocked me. I knew he did. He was competitive against left-handed pitching last year. I didn't realize he slashed 337, 388, 596 against left-handed pitching last season. Now, I don't think anybody thinks that's going to repeat, but all we're looking for is for him to be competitive against lefties and then maybe mash against righties. Last yeah. year, he's actually better against lefties, which is a little bit maybe unsustainable. But any lefty who kills left-handed pitching is a great hitter. That's almost always universally true. Also want to give you a big... A hit for Sarah Sanchez, who is the best Cubs friend of mine, the best Cubs source I know, along with Andy Barons in the industry. She's doing great work with Baseball HQ. She's a podcast this year with Pitcher List. And whenever I'm stuck on the Cubs, man, um, then uh, Barons would be a great guy to go to too. But he, you know, he ignores my texts usually when I send them. But um, actually, that's not true. I got I'm like 50 <laughs> Barons write me back, and he's a great guy, the, the uh, FSWA president and a longtime friend and colleague. Uh, Sarah Sanchez is somebody who you should read all of her work, but especially she understands the Cubs backwards and forwards. She'll probably be yeah. in the field for 20 games this year. Uh, she's just a rising star in the industry, and if you're not familiar with her work, I think you should uh, you should fix that this season. Yeah, and you can follow her on Twitter. Uh, she's at BCB underscore Sarah. That's Sarah without an H. Uh, so BCB underscore Sarah. Um, let's get to our top 12. Um, so who are your top 12 outfielders for this year? Yeah, uh, Dallas Garcia, who was, I think, 13th or 14th on your list, is somebody I want to draft three years in a row. He's done it. A Texas lineup that's really fun. Talk about fun lineups, Michael Harris. All he needs is a better slot. This Atlanta lineup, I think he'll get it this year on a per at bat basis. He's been dynamic. I have a number 11 outfielder, but I want to draft him. I want to have shares. I want to be overweight on Harris this year. Luis Robert doesn't have a fun lineup in Chicago where almost nothing has gone right, but uh, he certainly turned into a great player. Outfielder number 10 for me. Jordan Alvarez, maybe the best hitter in baseball right now. It feels weird having him ninth. On the outfield list, because I think you could take him ninth in a draft. Um, it sure. just speaks to how deep this position is. I want you to try to get him some. It's just I, I talked about lefties who can hit lefties. There's no way to get 
Jordan Alvarez out. We've seen that in the playoffs the last few years, just one of the maybe one of the two or three best hitters in baseball. Fernando Tatis has been a little bit frustrating. We'd like a little bit more consistency, but the power and speed will play. He's also turned himself into a very good defensive outfielder, so he makes sense. Outfielder eight, we talked a lot about Juan Soto. He's my number seven, tied to Aaron Judge at number six. It's only the games played for Judge. If I knew he'd play 150, I'd have him higher on this list. Kyle Tucker, talk about higher. He's been batting number six in that lineup for so long. This is finally the year he'll get promoted. That's been the only thing with Tucker. I still think there's some room for growth in his game. I have Mookie Betts, Julio Rodriguez, and, and Corbin Carroll, four, three, and two. But you could draft them in any position you want. I have Betts four right now, but in, I could be in a draft tomorrow and take him second overall on this board. They're all dynamic players who do wonderful things. Betts doesn't run as much as he used to, but he's in the better lineup. Uh, Carroll's going to be more about speed than power, but he obviously can do a lot of different things. And Julio Rodriguez could easily be on the cover of all the magazines next year. And then Ronald Acuna, what can you say? It's unfair. I, I don't really like picking on the end, Eric, but – I'll smile and bear it if I'm getting Ronald Acuna getting pick Acuna. number one. And I talked about uh, the Dodgers having, what, 10 of 109 picks in Yahoo right now. Uh, shout out to my editor, Jason Kabako, who gave me that stat. The Braves have eight of the top 84 right now in Yahoo ADP. It just shows how loaded that lineup is again for 2024. Yeah, I have not gotten Acuna anywhere. I would gladly, um, if given the opportunity. Uh, so my top 12, I have uh, Luis Robert, 12. I have Randy Arozarena, 11. Michael Harris, 10. Um, I'm big into a Michael Harris breakout this year. I think he also popped for me on batted ball quality when looking at, at pulled fly balls. I think there's some more power growth in his bat. I think there's a chance he could also move up the lineup um, in a great lineup. Uh, I, I really just think Michael Harris is in for a great year. and I love him as a, a speed target early too. Um, I also had Jordan Alvarez, 9. I had Juan Soto, 8. Um, his teammate, Aaron Judge, is 7 for me. Corbin Carroll is six. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Fernando Tatis is fifth for me. Kyle Tucker is fourth. Uh, Mookie Betts is third. Julio Rodriguez is second. And Ronald Acuna is first. Um, you mentioned I have Adelis Garcia one spot lower um, than you do. I have Luis Robert two spots lower than you do. And for me, that's just because I have Randy Arosa Reina 11. You have him 14. Um, I have always knocked Arosa Reina's. Um, profile in terms of his plate discipline um, in, as a way of suggesting, I don't necessarily think that, I didn't think there was growth when we were drafting him after his great playoff runs and everybody was like, Oh, what if he hits 290 with 30 home runs and whatever. And I was just saying, I don't think this profile lends itself to that. However, <clears throat> I feel a little better about his profile than at Elise Garcia's profile. Um, they're both free swingers, but a Rosarena walks a little bit more than Garcia um, swings outside of the zone a little bit less than Garcia. Um, I think you're going to get a slightly higher batting average for Randy or Rosarena. I think Garcia will hit more home runs, but I think you're going to get more speed from a Rosarena. So for me, I, I would rather take what I believe is a slightly safer profile um, in Randy or Rosarena. Also, uh, I was going to say he's, he's one year younger, so it's not uh, younger really at all. Um, and then, I moved him ahead of Luis Robert, um, and that's just health concerns for Luis Robert, too. Like we talked about that with, with Mike Trout. Luis Robert played 145 games last year, and that's great. It's the first time he's played over 100 games. So I, I'm not ready. All the projection systems have him for 143 again, and I'm not ready to give him 145 plate appearances again when last year was the first time we saw it. Uh, sorry, 145 games again, when last year was the first time we saw it. Almost every projection system has him for more plate appearances than he got last year. And I I can't do that. I can't take what was essentially a career year. And it's not even about skills. It's about health, right? So I can't take a guy who had struggled with health before, was finally healthy one year, and then say, okay, now he's healthy again. Um you know, maybe I'll project him for 130 games. I'm not going to like to ding him, you know, an exceptional amount, but that's 130 games in a lineup that is shockingly gross. Um, and so to me, I I find myself a little bit more comfortable taking a Rosa Reina a few picks later than taking Luis Robert where he goes. Um, and I'm curious if you have any concerns about Luis Robert, given the lineup and, and past injury history. Oh, for sure. I do. Um, I don't want to assume a full season, basically 145 games last year. The power speed is great. 
I talked about Mike Trout, about all the players around him are outside the top 500. I don't have the exact data in front of me, but I know the three players flanking Robert closest in that lineup are all people I don't want to draft. I don't want to draft Andrew Benintendi. Andrew Vaughn hasn't popped yet. You know, who knows what we're getting from Eli Jimenez. Juan Moncada has been a gigantic disappointment. This is the top of the lineup, Eric. It gets worse at the bottom of the lineup. You're yeah. drafting lineups. You want to go. We say in fantasy football, go where the points are. Go where the yardage is. In fantasy baseball, go where the runs are scored. Go with a team that excites you to watch. And Robert's going to cost an early pick. I don't know if the durability is there. He's a really good player. I'm going to be underweight on him this year. I ask you, Eric, and I ask the listener as well, what interesting things Randy Rosarena and Nadalos Garcia have in common? I think a little pause here. They're both members of the Cardinals a few okay. years ago. It's going to be really frustrating for Cardinals fans to think they could have those guys. I think, granted, there's a lot of talent in that lineup too, but uh, they could be teammates right now. They're not. They're good friends. They, they'll they ping pong each other back on social media. I feel like Garcia, for me, is a little bit more of a proactive pick because he's going to hit 30 to, to 40 home runs, where Rosarena is going to hit 20 to 25. And the Texas lineup just seems like it's deeper one through nine to me than Tampa Bay's is, but I'd be happy to draft either one of those guys. I think they're both very safe places to park your money. Yeah. Um, does it matter to you at all that Jordan Alvarez is hitting second? We talked about Kyle Tucker hitting fourth, and I think that we're both in agreement that, you know, there's a jump for Kyle Tucker here now that he's going to hit cleanup in this lineup. The skills have always been there, you know, power speed. I, I've, I've even put him up. In my, I mean, obviously you see he's fourth in my rankings. I, I'm happy to take him over a lot of guys who had been going over him in, in drafts. Um, but I don't know that it's meaningful that Jordan Alvarez is hitting second. I mean, I guess fewer RBI opportunities potentially going from cleanup to second. But are you dinging him at all for this move in the lineup or does it not matter to you? Not at all. I think it's still a deep lineup. It means he might get a few extra at-bats. So maybe the shape of it changes maybe you get a few more runs than you're expecting maybe you get a few fewer rbis and you're expecting you might hit a couple more home runs i'm okay with it i mean the point is he's surrounded by altuve in front of him bregman and tucker behind him all the right guys that you want around him and even the bottom of the lab isn't bad yeah the bottom three right now is is mccormick Payne, and myers which is which is interesting so um it may not be the astros of the trash can days but it's still a destination lineup for me and and Jordan Alvarez belong. I've been getting no Jordan Alvarez because he's a player. A lot of these early picks, you have to have the right slot. We talk about Acuna. You get to have the one pick or you don't get him. Mm -hmm. You have to have a pick around the wheel to get Alvarez. If you have like the third or fourth pick in your draft, you won't take him then. He'll never get back to you in the second round. So he's a very slot-specific player, and I don't have any Alvarez right now, which bothers me. Maybe I'll fix that in the salary cap drafts that I get in, and I'll make him a destination player because there's just no way to pitch him. It, it, it doesn't matter. You throw hard, you throw soft, you throw lefty, you throw righty, you throw anywhere in the zone, and he's, he spits on the bad pitches and he murders the good ones. I, If I had an at-bat for my life, I might give it to Jordan Alvarez right now. Right, and he's outfield eligible as opposed in for sure. past. He had just been util, utility eligible, so um, that's, that's great for me. Uh, Judge, you mentioned um, I took Judge at 12th overall in the TGFBI draft, which are going mm -hmm. on right now. Um, I really have no concerns about Judge's – health from the standpoint of this toe. I mean, I know they said the toe is going to take maintenance throughout the year. I do think there'll be opportunities for him to, to DH. Um, and so I think, you know, they'll, I, I still feel confident getting about 140 games from him. And this mm -hmm. is something where like, we have two seasons of him playing 148 and 157 games um, prior to last year's injury. And he was fully healthy last year with the exception of, again, a toe injury that was a fluke injury where he rammed his toe into a concrete um, at the bottom of an outfield fence. And so that's not something that's like, oh, judges' hamstrings are acting up again or, or whatever. So I fully think we're going to get 140 games out of him. I don't expect to get 16 steals like we did in 2022. If you are managing his toe or that you're doing maintenance on the toe, maybe you project him for closer to five, six, seven steals. Um, it's not going to be a nothing in the category. It's not enough to move the needle. But I still think if you get 140 games from Judge, he could push 50 home runs with a 270 or 280 batting average. Um and so I, re I really like that, and I'm happy to, to get him. Um, you and I both have him basically in the same exact spot. But I'm curious, one player we don't have in the same exact spot, 
is Fernando Tatis Jr. Um, is this because of concerns about Fernando Tatis Jr. or do you just like some of these other guys uh, more than him? Because I had him ranked fifth and you had him down at eighth. Yeah, I just like to see a little bit more consistency in his game. He hits 257 last year. Um, the power wasn't quite what I expected. I maybe maybe some people would say that consistency is an illusion anyway, and that yeah, there's just random variance and ranges of outcomes, and you have to live with that. But because that TC, he's had injuries, he's had suspension. The Padres lineup isn't as deep as it has been in past years. It's a matter of, to take a, a player like Tatis, you have to take him in the first round. And I just I feel like I, I have one foot in on Tatis. I feel like it's not two feet in. So I've found other guys that feel a little bit more comforting to me at the draft table. Fair. Um, I, I just look at that five category upside, um, and that's what's really intriguing me. Um, he had he's still 29 bases in 141 games last year. Um, I think he's fully healthy and ready to run. I don't see why we're not getting 30 from him this year. I think a 30-30 season is well within the cards for him, you know, with a, with a good usable batting average. Um, and as you mentioned, the Padres lineup was really bad last year or underperformed last year, mm -hmm. but there's still talent at the top of that lineup. And so I still think you could get 190 runs plus RBIs, maybe pushing 200 runs and RBIs from Tatis where, while going 30, 30. Um, and so I, I just personally like that over, what I'm getting from like Judge and Soto, where they're not quite giving me that five category production. Um, I have Tatis over Corbin Carroll, which I know is um, a big difference between your rankings. And for me, it's just the shoulder. Um, Corbin Carroll has battled shoulder injuries. Um, he had a shoulder injury last year where um, he, I think it was like uh, he, he, so first of all, sorry, he suffered a torn labrum in his shoulder in 2021. That was when he was a prospect. Um, and then last year, he like swung and winced and he was like on a knee and it, it was the same shoulder and it looked like everything was, you know, horrible again. And they called it a stinger and the MRI results came back clean. Um, and they said, again, it's something he needs maintenance on. But for me, it happened again at another point where he he aggravated his shoulder, but there was no damage. I just look at like a player with a major shoulder injury who twice last year experienced discomfort in that shoulder in a way that scared people, then had no surgery or nothing to clean it up because it was quote unquote fine in the offseason. To me, I just think there's a, a little bit of risk in that, especially considering so much of Carroll's value is in his speed and we understand that when players are stealing second and he stole 54 bases last year i'd say 90 percent of the time guys are sliding head first which puts a lot of, of potential strain on that shoulder um and so i don't have a problem taking corbin carroll i really like taking corbin carroll but i just have him down behind kyle tucker and fernando tatis because i i worry i think there's more risk with his shoulder than people are willing to admit right now totally fair and if i were you know redoing my list i, I might move carol down a few slots because in the first round everybody in the first round has a high upside but i don't think everybody has the same floor and so if you can talk yourself into concerns about carol as you mentioned anytime a player has an injury and they say well rest in rehab that just always makes me nervous maybe it's more of a pitcher yeah. fear than it is an offensive player fear, but we have to, you need to be healthy. If you draft Corbin Carroll, you need 50 stolen bases, not right. 20, not 30. You need 50 because he doesn't, last year might be the high end of his power. Maybe some year he hits 30 home runs. He's never going to hit 40 or 50. He's somebody who a big part of his value is driven by the stolen bases and you have to be healthy to steal bases. So first round, I don't want, and I get it. Anybody can, you know, get hit inside fastball, break their wrist or whatever. I mean, Yes. You, you don't have any control over that, but if there's even the tiniest bit of yeah, this guy makes me a little bit nervous, don't take him in the first round. You should be so overjoyed with your first four or five picks, and then you have to start doing things that feel awkward and feel weird, or you have to maybe talk yourself into. Don't talk yourself into your first round pick. You should be over the moon about that guy, and if you're not, well, find somebody else you are. Yeah, you can't miss. You can't miss with the first round pick. It it derails so much of the season. Um, and again, if you're not worried, fine. The upside in Corbin Carroll is clear. Nobody's going to debate that. Um, 
I would just rather take somebody who doesn't come in with a question mark um, with an injury. And like I, I mentioned, I don't believe that Judge, I know it's like hypocritical that I took Judge in the first round. First of all, I took him 12th. If Corbin Carroll had fallen to 12th, I would have jumped all over that. But I don't, I don't consider Judge the same type of question mark given um, the way in which Carroll got injured and the his style of play and how that could easily aggravate that injury. Um, I feel like we, we touched on basically everything. Is there anything else that, that you want to mention with any of these guys? I mean, we know how good Ronald Acuna is. There's really no uh, reason to, to discuss that. If you have the opportunity to, you know, get a draft where you can, you know, bid on the first round pick or, you know, set a KDS where you can put your order of preference. I mean, try to get the first round pick. He's far and away the best player in fantasy. Um, if you're worried about Julio Rodriguez because he hasn't played in spring training games yet, he had slight hand inflammation. He's going to play this weekend. They said there's literally no concern over it. They just didn't feel like rushing him back um, when there's no reason for him to be playing games in February. Um, and then we talked about Mookie Betts a bunch on, on other podcasts at the beginning of this one. So anything else you feel you need to add? You hit something I was going to ask you about with Acuna, where if you can pick your slot, I generally hate picking on the end. And the reward has to be worth it for me to take a number one overall pick. There has to be an obvious player. And Acuna to me is that player because yeah. of the power, because of the willingness to run. He doesn't even have necessarily elite sprint speed compared to some other guys, but he wants to run. I, I don't think you can expect 70 stolen bases again, but you know mm -hmm. something in the 35 to 50 range sounds perfectly reasonable. And mm -hmm. I'm always talking about the depth of lineups, the buoyancy of lineups. That's never going to be a problem with the Braves. We're one through one, nine. They have a loaded team. Yeah. Uh, I'll also yeah. curious to see if they get something out of Jared Kelnick, who's been, if it feels like he should be old enough to retire right now, but he's still in his mid twenties. Maybe some of the Atlanta magic can rub off on him and he can have that breakout season we've waited for. I would put in my KDS would start with one. My second my second slot might be in the middle somewhere, but there could be a lot of debates about where it could go. But I think everybody should want the number one pick my first and foremost. I, I, I used to put it last because I was okay drafting on the turn if I was, you know, 15, 16 or 12, 13, depending on how many teams were in your league. And I hated being one because I waited mm -hmm. so long. But I find a, the, the value in Acuna is great. And then the way drafts are going right now, I can get another solid hitter in my last pick in the second round. And then I get to choose um, which starting pitcher I really like. Because we've talked about how, um, and we will talk about more next week uh, on our starting pitcher rankings, that there's a lot of question marks like outside of the top, maybe three or four guys. And at the top of the third round, there's almost always um, a huge slew of potential starting pitcher ones and you can, if you have that Acuna pick, you get to basically choose whether you prefer Luis Castillo, whether you prefer Kevin Gossman, if you're, you know, in on um, Pablo Lopez, maybe Zach Wheeler falls to you. So th there's a lot of options to go based on the way drafts are going. Um, and we'll talk about some of those names and give you um, some of our thoughts on starting pitching. Uh, next week, we're going to go through two episodes for our starting pitchers, just like we went through two episodes um, for our outfielders today to try to give you as many guys um, as possible. I will be updating my top 100 starting pitcher rankings um, at the beginning of March. So that's next week. Um, so make sure to check that out um, on NBC Sports. You can also check that out if you follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm at Samsky NYC. I tweet out all of my articles um, and some spring training recaps. Scott is on Twitter at Scott underscore Pianowski. Um, yeah, you got, you got anything to say before we sign off? Yeah, I want to give you one more thing. Three words. Draft Michael Harris. Yes, do it. Those are your sign-off words. Draft Michael Harris, and we'll tell you which starting pitchers to draft next week on the Roto-World Baseball Show.